Tonight, moment of truth. Millions of Indonesians battle heavy floods as they made their way to the polling booths. Vote counts underway as the nation awaits the release of election results. Marching on. Farmers continue their protests in India, refusing to back down on making good on key pledges made by the government over the years. Joining hands. Pakistan sees the formation of a coalition with Shabazz Sharif on top, while Imran Khan voices out against alleged rigging and theft of democracy. And grand gestures. Couples in Thailand tie the knot on the backs of gentle giants this Valentine's in the ultimate portrayal of love. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. Great to have you tune in this evening. We have quite a lot to get you up to date on tonight, from Pakistan's new means of governance to the chaos in the US Senate. But first, we focus on the world's largest single-day elections that just took place in Indonesia. Polls have closed in Indonesia's elections after millions turned out to select the successor to President Joko Widodo, also known as Jokowi, who is serving the last of his two terms in office. Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto is seen as the frontrunner, while two former provincial governors, Anis Baswedan and Ganja Pranowo, are also vying for the country's top job. More than 204 million of Indonesia's 270 million people were eligible to vote for a new president and vice president, as as well as for thousands of parliamentary and local representatives. Heavy rain and flooding caused some problems on the morning of election day, particularly in Jakarta and Java, but did not seem to dampen the voters' enthusiasm. Prabowo's campaign team says it is confident of an outright victory today. The comments came after an unofficial vote counts published by several independent polisters showed Prabowo leading with almost 60% of ballots cast. Prabowo Subianto's supporters have gathered at Istora Senean, an indoor sporting arena in Jakarta, to celebrate a potential single round win. A steady stream of black cars have been pulling up at the stadium, getting very close to Prabowo's arrival. He'll be with his running mate Gibran Rakabumi in Raka, who is outgoing leader Jokowi's eldest son. Outgoing President Jokowi's eldest son is one of the three vice presidential hopefuls. However, the 36 year old's candidacy was possible only after a constitutional court made an exception to rule a last October that prevents those under 40 from running from the nation's top post. The court, then Chief Justice Anmar Usman, also Djokovic's brother-in-law, cast the deciding vote, sparking allegations and nepotism and corruption. An ethics panel removed Anwar from his post for not recusing himself from the proceedings. Many analysts say Prabowo owes his popularity to Djokovic, who is perceived to have given a tacit blessing to Prabowo Gibran Pari. Indonesian President Joko Widodo is facing mounting criticism over alleged interference in the country's looming elections. Over in neighbouring India, now farmers are still going strong with their protest efforts. The march shows no signs of stopping or slowing down, despite the efforts to barricade and tear gas the masses by Indian authorities. Talks have attempted to quell the group's anger. However, it seems the demographic is prepared to not go back home to the fields until several pledges made by the government many years back begin to be upheld starting right now. Tonight, chaos in India as police clash with thousands of frustrated farmers. Police spraying crowds with tear gas, detaining a number of protesters and setting up barricades to stop waves of tractors from rolling into the heart of New Delhi. हां देखिए किसान कितना पीसफुल है कुछ भी नहीं हो रहा फिर भी आप ऊपर क्या बोलते हैं रॉबर्ट से ऊपर से हंजू गैस फेंके जा रहे हैं ड्रोन से ड्रोन से For the farmers it's simple they want guaranteed crop prices and say Prime Minister Modi's government failed to deliver on promises made in 2021 following months of similar protests Money is at the heart of their anger and Indian farmers aren't the only ones setting fire to the system. In recent months, farmers have protested in France, Italy, Spain, Belgium, and Bulgaria. On the surface, the protests in Europe and India are similar. 
The details, however, are a little more complex. In many European countries, the frustration stems from concerns about globalization and climate change. In India, farmers support a greener path forward, but feel the government is not providing the necessary financial support to make it possible. To the power struggle in Pakistan now, two of Pakistan's major political parties, the Pakistan Muslim League Namaz and the Pakistan People's Party, say they will form a coalition government after last week's inconclusive elections. The move means the party of former Prime Minister Imran Khan will not be in power, despite independent candidates affiliated with it gaining the most votes. The Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz released a statement that Shabha Shari would be the party's candidate for Prime Minister. The Pakistan People's Party chairman Bilawal Bhutto Sardari had said his party would support the PLM in candidate for Prime Minister. None of the three major parties won enough seats to have a majority in the parliament and therefore were unable to form a government on their own. Khan, who is currently in jail and was barred from running in the election, announced separately that the independent candidates associated with his party would join the lesser known Majis Wahadate Muslimin party, which won only one seat in the parliament. Khan also ruled out the possibility of creating a coalition with the Pakistan People's Party or the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. Khan's Pakistan Tehri Gain Saaf Party made claims of wide scale rigging in the election. Bhutto Sardari had said that the PPP would form a committee to deliberate on the party's vote on important issues such as the national budget, the Prime Minister's election, and important legislation. The party would also field its candidates for the National Assembly Speaker, Chairman of the Senate, and President, he said. Under Pakistani law, parliament must convene within 21 days after an election has taken place so lawmakers can be sworn in and then elect a new prime minister. Artillery and accusations are flying back and forth in the Israel-Palestine conflict. The UN is now sounding the warning bells on Israel's offensive in Rafah, claiming grim circumstances should the violence continue. Meanwhile, relatives of Israeli hostages held by Hamas in Gaza have departed Israel to The Hague to submit legal findings urging the International Criminal Court to investigate Hamas crimes. The United Nations has voiced concerns over Israel's ground offensive in Gaza's southernmost city of Rafah, where more than half of Gaza's population is sheltering from the war. Ahead of a Security Council meeting on Tuesday, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he hopes for successful negotiations to avoid an all-out offensive over Rafah, which he says would have devastating consequences. On the same day, the UN's humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, warned that a ground invasion in Rafah could lead to a slaughter. Meanwhile, talks between the U.S., Egypt, Israel and Qatar over a truce in Gaza reportedly ended without any progress on Tuesday. The New York Times says talks have been extended for three more days. Over in the U.S. now, the country's arms of legislature are scrambling to keep their composure tonight. For the first time in close to 150 years, a sitting cabinet secretary has been impeached by the House of Representatives. It was a close vote, 214 to 213, and it comes just a week after House Republicans failed to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas. In the midst of this, with the newly proposed international aid packages, questions arise as to where the priorities of the Senate really lies. Is adopted. Tonight, just one week after House Republicans failed attempt to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, round two. This time, they have the votes, accusing the Biden cabinet official of unlawfully allowing millions of migrants to cross the border, which Mayorkas denies. <laughs> All as there's a new showdown tonight over aid to Ukraine. After the Senate muscled through a massive bipartisan $95 billion spending package in the early morning hours, including $60 billion for Ukraine. President Biden demanding the House pass it immediately. Failure to support Ukraine at this critical moment will never be forgotten. Biden slamming these comments from Trump where he recounted a conversation with a NATO member encouraging Russia to attack countries who'd not met their financial pledges to the alliance. Can you imagine a former president of the United States saying that? The whole world heard it. The worst thing is he means it. And delivering this blistering rebuke. No other president in our history has ever bowed down to a Russian dictator. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. 
I never will. For God's sake, it's dumb, it's shameful, it's dangerous, it's un-American. Many Republicans defending Mr. Trump. I'm 100% behind him and have been. He started this years ago when he even went over there to their face and said, listen, what American taxpayers can't afford to keep paying your bills. Meanwhile, that package in the Senate also contained more than $14 billion for Israel. But it does not include any funding for domestic border security. After Republicans, with Trump's backing, killed a bipartisan border security bill, saying it was not tough enough. Tonight, House Speaker Mike Johnson saying that's the price for any new money for Ukraine. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with updates on the South Carolina primaries and also on Russia's recent arrest warrants. Stay tuned. Welcome back. On the road to the White House tonight, Nikki Haley is pulling out all the stops for her campaign in the home state of South Carolina, doubling down on her attacks on Trump's recent remarks on NATO and her deployed husband. Now, despite the claims of being unhinged, it seems Donald Trump is still well on his way to victory in the state. Tonight, Nikki Haley dialing up her attacks on Donald Trump. When he's not on a teleprompter, He's completely unhinged. Scrambling to catch up with the GOP frontrunner in her home state, even as a new poll shows Trump with a more than 30-point lead there. He lost in 2018, he lost in 2020, he lost in 2022, and he continues to lose. How many more times do we have to lose where we, until we start to say, maybe he's the problem? This as Mr. Trump makes increasingly personal comments about Haley's husband, Michael, a National Guard officer deployed in Africa. What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. He knew. He knew. Trump posting overnight that he should come back home to help save Haley's dying campaign. If you don't know the value of our men and women in uniform, if you don't know the sacrifice that they go through, why should I, as a military spouse and all our military families, trust you to know you're going to keep them out of harm's way? The back and forth coming as Trump tries to look past Haley and the primary, consolidating his hold on the Republican Party by installing new allies atop the Republican National Committee, overnight endorsing an election-denying loyalist as party chairman, plus his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, for co-chair, and pushing the installation of a senior campaign advisor as the party's chief operating officer. That would push out longtime party chair Ronna McDaniel, a one-time ally of Trump's now on the outs. But the move would require an internal party vote, likely after next week's South Carolina primary. Russian police have put Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kalas, Lithuania's culture ministers and members of the previous Latvian parliament on a wanted list for destroying Soviet-era monuments. This is according to the Russian Interior Ministry's database. We have other than a world news special correspondent, Sadapini Dungarala, in Kursk, Russia, with the latest. Sadapini. Yes, Anuradi. The accused call the allegations by Russia crazy. The three countries were once ruled from Moscow but are now members of both the European Union and NATO. Since the Russian invasion in Ukraine, they have become stone supporters of Kyiv and vocal critics of Russia. The Baltic governments regard the monuments as propaganda tools constructed by their former imperial overlords. A Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman warned this is only the beginning. She added crimes against the memory of the world's liberators from Nazism and fascism must be prosecuted. According to the Russian state news agency, the punishment under the Russian criminal code for monument destruction is five years in prison. But in practical terms, being on the list is unlikely to have real consequences. The politicians only risk being arrested if they enter Russia. The Estonian government has said up to 400 monuments would be dismantled in the country. On social media, they have said they wouldn't be silenced by the Kremlin. Back to you, one Radi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Sadabini Dugan Rala in Kursk, Russia. Thanks again. 
Weather woes as hundreds of thousands of residents across Australia's Victoria state remain without power after wild weather knocked down transmission lines and sparked bushfires that injured five firefighters. Strong winds forced down transmission lines, tripping the generators at power stations. The outage impacted half a million properties, one of the largest in Victoria's history. Other than as Binet Senaviratna in Melbourne, Australia has the details. Binet. Yes, Sanradi. Authorities report one man was killed by flying debris in the south of the state. Train services on some Melbourne, route, Melbourne routes were suspended, and at least 10 schools and dozens of childcare centres were closed. A catastrophic fire warning had been issued in one region, Australia's highest level of bushfire danger. In the state's west, firefighters battled to contain three bushfires sparked by lightning. There were also widespread disruptions to transport in Melbourne, with half the city's train lines being suspended. Public Transport Victoria said it has been forced to shut many lines down due to the multiple reports of storm damage. Australia's Weather Bureau forecasts milder conditions with temperatures in the, in the low to mid-20 degrees Celsius and moderate winds, but warned that the risk, of, the risk was not over yet. Back to you, Anravi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Binet Sarmaratna in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks. China's permanent representative to the United Nations, Zhang Jun, called for accelerating the bridging of the North-South development gap and effectively enhancing the climate resilience and food security of developing countries. Zhang made the statement at a Security Council high-level open debate about the impact of climate change and food insecurity on the maintenance of global peace and security. The debate was initiated by Guinea, which has the rotating presidency of the Security Council. Stressing that the climate change concerns human survival and development, Sang said China supports the international community in taking effective actions to address the challenges posed by climate change. More and more extreme weather events are impacting global food production, with the developing countries bearing the brunt. He said that adverse effects of the extreme weather cannot be ignored. He called on development countries to provide more food and funds to developing countries in need, emphasizing the humanitarian assistance should not be used as a tool for exerting pressure, nor should it be subject to any political conditions. Sang also urged for efforts to bridge the divide between global south and north. He said the current global food production is completely sufficient to meet needs of everyone, yet nearly 800 million people are still suffering from hunger. This is a concrete manifestation of the imbalance and inadequacy of global development. Only through common development can we fundamentally solve the problem. India and the UAE are continuing to foster better international relations as of late. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is set to inaugurate the BAPS Swaminarayan Mandir in Abu Dhabi, cementing a milestone in the bilateral ties between the United Arab Emirates and India. The inauguration is one of many diplomacy activities scheduled for the Indian leader in the UAE, one of the most notable being the talks on a transcontinental trade corridor. The BAPS Hindu Mandir, built on a sprawling 27-acre site in Abu Dhabi desert, is the city's first traditional Hindu stone mandir. Its pink sandstone columns topped by seven spires representing the number of Sikhs that rule each of the Emirates. Modi was greeted with a hug by the country's president, Sheikh Mohammed bin Said Al Nayan, and presented with a guard of honour, showing how close the two nations have come in their strategic and economic relations. But while the Islam is the official religion of UAE, Modi's stream comes as Muslims in India say they feel marginalised and threatened as Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party's Hindu nationalist policies gain momentum in the world's largest democracy. Yet, analysts expect this will not present an issue for Modi during his visit, given India's rising prominence, its growing economy and strategic position on the global stage. And back home, analysts say Modi's leading role in Temple's inauguration could give his party a boost in the build to the election in a few months' time. The opening of the Abu Dhabi Temple comes just as few weeks after Modi inaugurated his controversial Ram Mandir, a temple built on the foundations of country's old mosque that was torn down by hardline Hindu crowds in the early 1990s in the northern India. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more world news. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
On the day celebrating love brimming with excitement, nine couples in Thailand exchange vows while riding elephants during a special Valentine's Day mass wedding event in the eastern province of Shonburi. Some participants adorned themselves in colorful Thai traditional attire as they rode on the backs of elephants, while performers danced to lead a procession at Nongnuch Tropical Gardens. A local district official also riding an elephant oversaw the signing of the marriage license, marking the beginning of a marital journey. The newlywed said elephants have been considered household companions of Thais since the ancient times, which makes the ceremony all the more sacred for the many couples. And finally tonight, got an ex that bugs you? You can name a roach after them for Valentine's Day. For just $15, anyone can name a Bronx Zoo-based Madagascar hissing cockroach as a Valentine's Day expression of love or hate. The caretakers say that certainly many people name it after an ex or they can support someone who recently had a breakup by naming it after their ex. But by far the majority of the roaches that get named are in a loving fashion, like it's for people, as a gesture of love and a gesture of friendship. For example, parents name roaches for their kids because the children love the bugs. As the caretakers like to say, flowers wilt, chocolates melt, but this lasts forever. So you have forever symbolically named a roach at the Bronx Zoo. In addition to a digital certificate, the gift can also include a virtual meet-up with a Madagascar hissing cockroach and roach socks as well as a plush. Elephants and roaches, what peculiar choices for the day of love. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. See you next time. Have a good night.